Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today on our session to learn more about how social media um, can be used in your prospect research efforts. We have a very big group with us here, and um, we are at the top of the hour, so let's get started. My name is Katherine Bergerson. I am the Vice President of Marketing. I will be joined today by Jacob Astley with the Oklahoma State University Foundation. As we kick things off today, I just want to let you know that the session is recorded and that you will receive a copy via email after the session. So on our agenda today, I'll quickly share a bit of background information on Insightful, then we'll jump right into the program with the top social media strategies for prospect researching. We'll have a few next steps. And we'll be happy to take your questions. Jacob will pause throughout the presentation. Um, you'll likely see icons on the left side of your screen. There's four or five of them. If you open that up, you can just click there and type in your questions, or you can download the handouts that we have for you. And we'll do our best to get to all of the questions. If we do run short on time, we commit to getting back to you in the very near future. To share just a bit of background, Insightful is powered by our parent company, NewsBank. NewsBank is a leading news and information provider, aggregating news sources from all around the world, bringing teams access to credible, vetted global news sources, many of which are unique to our company and all are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I'm proud to share with you that NewsBank recently celebrated our 51st anniversary as a company. So about Insightful, Insightful is part of NewsBank's philanthropy division. It's a new software that draws upon these news resources and helps keep nonprofits on top of crucial news about donors and prospects that they can't afford to miss in order to promote better philanthropic engagement. And it's really this simple. It comes down to three things. When you know more, you can deepen relationships and raise more money to do more good in the world. So the reason that we're all here today, of course, is to learn more about how to really leverage social media in your prospect research. Leading our discussion, again, is Jacob Athley. He serves as the Vice President of Prospect Development at Oklahoma State University Foundation. Jacob is leading the team and he oversees the prospect research and prospect engagement teams and partners with the foundation's development team to ensure that there is a continuous flow of information and promising leads that helps make the development officers successful. Jacob holds a bachelor's degree in English from the University of Science and Arts in Oklahoma. He lives in Perkins, Oklahoma with his wife, three kids, and numerous cats and dogs. Please join me in welcoming Jacob Astley. Hi, Jacob. Yeah, yeah, you know, you get one dog and one cat and they lead, lead to another. So you just have to go with numerous after a while. Um, and I think <laughs> really appreciate uh, in your introduction, Catherine, uh, talking about, you know, news bank and insightful and deepening relationships because social media research is great for that. <laughs> um, so it just really syncs up very nicely. Um, this, this opportunity to discuss, uh, you know, kind of how, how to leverage social media research and um, make it meaningful and do it in a way that you are successful. All right, um, I'm Jacob Astley. I'm at Oklahoma State University, uh, which is located in Stillwater, Oklahoma, which is about an hour from Oklahoma City and an hour from Tulsa. It's a land-grant university that was founded on Christmas Day in 1890, has about 24,000 students and 265,000 living alumni. The Oklahoma State University Foundation exists to serve the philanthropic mission of uh, OSU. There are about 160 staff members, of which more than 50 are development officers. We are ramping up for a campaign, so it seems like um, I get a new announcement every day of a new development officer joining the team. So, um, But the prospect development team consists of five members, if you don't include me, and I am the least important member of the team. Um, but two prospect researchers and two members of prospect engagement, and then a team member who's kind of that utility player who uh, supports both sides of the house. Starting off, we'll cover what social media is and who, who is using it. Uh, then we'll go into the guidelines for using social media. Um, it, it can be as, as powerful as social media is, it's still a fairly new 
way of um, sharing information. And um, we're still, I think as an industry, figuring out the best ways to approach it. Also cover examples of what can be found in social media. Um, you, you can get insights in social media you can't get anywhere else. And um, the examples I will be sharing are real life examples, though anonymized, of ways that was helpful, help move the relationship as it were um, with a donor um, that my team had stumbled across. We'll also cover the social media toolkit. So kind of those key social media platforms that generally are the most helpful for social media research. And we will zero in on Facebook. You'll see in this presentation, Facebook is very dominant. <laughs> um, however, many, you know, still king of the hill, despite um, kind of all the challenges it's had over the years. It's, it's, it's numbers in terms of users are still very solid and dwarf the other platforms. I'll cover some scenarios, scenarios that you'll encounter sometimes in social media um, research. You know, kind of recommendations how to support, you know, basically approach certain situations. And then we'll go through tips and tricks and then we'll wrap up. So, what is social media and who is using it? Social media is an electronic form of communication through which users create online communities to share information, ideas, personal me messages, and other content. So, in a nutshell, that's what makes social media so powerful is its primary source of information that comes from the users themselves. And whenever I say who is using social media, we're almost to the point where you can say everyone. <laughs> we're not quite there. But, you know, NewsBank, which I did not realize until Catherine's introduction uh, that NewsBank was recently celebrating 50 years. That, that's incredible, an incredible run. Social media came around, you know, We'll, we'll get into the timeline about 25 years ago. And really, in terms of tracking who's using it, we didn't really, you know, as an industry, um, didn't really start tracking it until about 2005, so almost 20 years ago. And at that time, 5% of American adults were using a social media platform. And that number has jumped <laughs> to almost three quarters of American adults are now using some form of social media. And then if you expand out, from the United States, from America to the world. Right now, almost 5 billion people are using social media with that number expected to increase to 5.85 billion by 2027. And so if you think about it, there are approximately 8 billion people in the world, 61% of the human population uses some form of social media with that number increasing to around 75% in just four years. So it's just an incredible growth. So around the time NewsBank was uh, celebrating its 25th anniversary, uh, social media was kicking off. Uh, the first social media site launched in 1997, which is the year I graduated from high school. I do not remember six degrees. So if, please chime into the chat if you are a six degree user. Uh, six degrees admittedly did not have a very long run. It, uh, it shut down the year I graduated from college in 2001, uh, but it kind of kicked this whole thing off. Uh, MySpace uh, launched in 2002, and that was also the same year that LinkedIn launched. So 2002 was, you know, if you think about 1997 as being the initial year, 2002 is whenever social media really kind of took the form that we know and love, I guess, today, um, especially with that launch of MySpace. Uh, MySpace in 2008, or actually, I'm sorry, 2007 was the most visited site in the world. And Facebook, which was founded in 2004, became the most visited site in the world just the following year after MySpace had uh, kind of gotten that crown. 2008, Facebook basically opened itself up to everybody. And actually, actually, that's the year that I started prospect research. And uh, one of the first things I did in September of 2008 was when I started prospect research, I created a Facebook account because I never used it before. I was like, well, it seems like a lot of people are jumping on this. and I probably need this for my job. So. Um, but it's pretty incredible. You think about how MySpace was the dominant site, most visited site in the world in 2007, and then just a year later, Facebook um, kind of got that honor. And Facebook's held on to that ever since then for 15 years. Um, you know, you see Instagram on this chart, TikTok, which launched in, launched in 2017, you know, a bit of a different format in terms of social media than Facebook, admittedly. Um, but that one's Probably the fastest growing social media platform um, 
since you know Facebook uh, came on the scene, uh, just a very dominant platform. But all that to say, you know, as we as we look ahead to the numbers of users, Facebook is solidly number one, um, almost three billion users, and then Instagram. You know, it's definitely that top five, but it's also owned by that same parent company as Facebook. So it's owned by Meta. And Instagram is also you know, becoming more and more, and we'll talk a lot about Instagram as we get further along, but trying to pivot a bit away from the original start as a place where people share their pictures and photos to one that's, um, you know, I think it's called Reels, and we have that in the presentation course, uh, short form videos in response to TikTok. So if I were to do this presentation again in say five years, I'm very curious to see um, exactly what this chart looks like, especially with how TikTok is growing. But LinkedIn, and LinkedIn is my favorite social media platform, by the way, uh, just a little teaser when we get to that part, um, is nearing the 1 billion user mark. And a lot of that started during the pandemic. So you know, LinkedIn is, is really seems to have found its footing, especially with kind of shifts in the, you know, the, the industries during the pandemic um and it's really i'm really curious to see how that grows as well i want to point out that twitter for <laughs> i still have it as twitter in my presentation and i don't think i'll ever call it x i still don't call it x i'm not acknowledging that it is um you know only a half billion users it, is, it does not have the user base of say of facebook by any stretch of the imagination or even a linkedin Pinterest, I want to give a shout out to Pinterest and we'll talk a little bit about Pinterest because like, you know, uh, Instagram is a very visual social media platform, not a ton of users, but if you can find the account of somebody who uses Pinterest that you're researching and they have, you know, they have to have a, you know, of course, a Pinterest account first, uh, but say they have a, a Pinterest account it is an incredibly valuable and useful resource. So you don't stumble across a Pinterest account every day, <laughs> but if you can find one, it is incredibly helpful. Social media usage by age. Um, the 24 to 34 year old age group is the largest age group, age group across the platforms. We're just gonna focus on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn here. But Facebook does have that reputation of having an older user base. And that's definitely borne out <laughs> as you look at these age ranges because 22% of Facebook users are over the age of 55. You think about the age demographic of your best prospects, you know, having a social media platform with a lot of users that are 55 plus is very helpful for research, I'll say that. Um, it seems like Facebook has been and continues to be the best social media platform for looking at major gift prospects or, or conducting social media research on major gift prospects. Instagram, you know, it, it's definitely, I would say, you know, trends to the younger side, um, but still has some respectable, you know, usage numbers with um, some older age groups. LinkedIn, and this is where you really see the nature of the platform, the audience, because every social media platform is geared towards people create the content for specific audiences. You really see that reflected with LinkedIn's uh, age breakdowns because they don't even bother having a you know 65 plus year old uh breakdown here they just say okay 55 plus and then even then it's only three percent of users so linkedin it's made for networking it's made for um career advancement job seekers and so understandably its age demographics are look quite different from facebook and instagram social media usage by gender Generally speaking, there are more women uh, than men on social media, but it, the difference isn't that large. Um, I, I would still say and argue this, it's fairly evenly divided. Um, Facebook, there are more men on Facebook than women, but you also look at, say, Instagram, and that number does get closer. And then you look at Pinterest, and that's where it's, as you get the more, the, the you, you would say the social media platforms they don't have as large of a user base. That's where you see those uh, differences between gender usage in terms of social media platforms really present themselves. Pinterest is 76% of users, over three quarters of users are women. And on Twitter, it's almost flipped. Um, there are 60% of users are male, over 60% of users are male. 
and 34% are women. Others, as I said, the, you know, the, the differences are not quite a, as pronounced as uh, you especially see with Twitter and Pinterest. Guidelines for using social media. Um, whenever I presented on this at APRA, uh, Lauren Woodring from the Philadelphia Museum of Art, uh, reached, she reached out to me and asked if I'd be interested in talking about this. And I said, sure. And she said, well, I'm, I'm training a new researcher. And they said, and then my researcher asked me, how can I use social media as a resource for research without feeling creepy? <laughs> and that was an excellent guidance for me as, as I put this together. And as I, as I thought about it, I'm like, you know, I came to the conclusion that it's not bad to feel creepy. It's actually a good thing because it means that you respect the power that social media holds and the fact that you need to conduct yourself in social media research with thoughtfulness and respect. Um, and we're going to dive into the reasons for that. The data in social media is shared directly by the users themselves or specific audiences, primarily friends and family. Um, definitely different with LinkedIn, of course, but for say the largest social media platform like Facebook, it's it's for friends and family. Um, social media, given its nature, contains information about the full range of the human experience. So marriages, divorces, having children, um, those children growing up, career changes, uh, so on and so forth information and insights that you cannot find anywhere else because again this is shared by say the prospects and donors themselves and, and put out there for those specific audiences so APRA the professional organization for prospect research does have some guidelines around how to conduct yourself as a professional whenever leveraging social media for the purposes of research and so APRA and this, you know, we have that first bullet. This is taken from APRA's Ethics and Compliance Toolkit. Acknowledges that the extraordinary opportunities provided by social media for the purposes of prospect research. Also, in the second bullet point acknowledges that users are not passive participants in social media, but engage with it and participate in both personally and professionally. And so APRA has set up five guidelines to help professionals make ethical choices about how they leverage that social media. So here are the five guidelines. I will not read every word of this, <laughs> but I will zoom in on certain portions, which, you know, you can see the highlighted sections. You've got a pretty good idea uh, of the ones I'm really going to zero in on. It is interesting, you know, the, in terms of the guidelines, the first uh, integrity and then conduct and then number five. So three out of the five guidelines are about how to conduct your own personal self on social media. So, um, you know, have, be transparent about your identity, can conduct yourself as a professional. Um, and number five, I love the tone in it, do not create fake profiles on social media platforms. You know, that's like, yeah, just, Hey, be yourself, right? Um, but the ones that we'll look at most closely in this presentation are numbers two and three, accountability and practice. As we go through these, kind of the key thing to hone in on, and I did add in red text at the at the bottom of the slide, you know, when you're faced with a crossroads, just think, does it inform fundraising activities or does it not? If it does, then, then and if it you know doesn't violate anything else in here, okay, it's useful, right? This helps move the relationship forward. And we'll dive into that in the examples portion of this presentation, um, exactly what that can look like. But if it doesn't inform fundraising activities, cast it aside and move on. So that's kind of just that simple true north, you know, uh, guiding star as you're working through, frankly, the flood of information and data you see in social media is, Okay, is it going to inform fundraising activities or not? So looking at number two, accountability, conduct yourself with the highest levels of professionalism and discretion. So use that discretion. <laughs> and anything you gather is only to be shared if it's part of the standard business operation. So it goes back, if you're at a fundraising shop, does it inform, you know, your standard business operations, is, you know, everything is around fundraising, does it inform the fundraising? 
Number three, again, honing in on that, is it appropriate to fundraising activities and can be used for fundraising purposes and stored legally in your organization's database? I will say I am not a lawyer. <laughs> um, there have been times I've asked our legal counsel for their thoughts. Never be afraid to seek legal guidance. Never be afraid to talk to a colleague. Never be afraid to go to the Prospect L and uh, you know the listserv and, and kind of see what sort of conversation there is around this. But kind of my, uh, my thinking is, and when in doubt, talk to your lawyer. <laughs> this is a good way to go. Um, Catherine, before we move along, any questions from the audience about any of the, the guidelines or anything else I've talked about? We do. We have a couple of, of great comments and, and questions that are coming in, and I encourage um, everyone to continue to, to enter, enter comments. Uh, on the, the six degrees, uh, we got crickets. No, no, no. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, if somebody was a six degrees user, can we get them on camera? I want to talk to them. I want to hear them. <laughs> Well, <laughs> I had to follow up on that one. No, I know, it's been waiting here. Yeah. <laughs> we do have a, a comment about MySpace that they missed their, their favorite friends list on, on MySpace. Uh, we must yeah, be Tom, yeah, Tom was their vice friend on MySpace. I do miss Tom. I wonder if he has a Facebook page. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go back and find him. Uh, yeah. And yes, the Facebook is helpful when trying to determine uh, a constituent's marital status and to whom. So yeah, thank thank you for sharing for sharing that comment. Um, one question about the best way to find prospects on Instagram and Pinterest. I'm not if you're going to address that or if you could address that. Yes, um, that will be addressed later on in the presentation. I will say. There are services that work to kind of help, you know, search across various social media platforms. I like to play it on the safe side and go ahead and search directly on the platform itself. Often I'll search the person's name, the city they live in, um, you know, any other identifiable information. Uh, the searches have gotten a lot better at social media platforms. And so just play it on the safe side. I usually do search directly on the platform itself um, and it include especially a location, you know, say Perkins, Oklahoma in that search. Um, and you know, this this may go to the, the point of kind of, of, of creepy versus not creepy and, and how do you walk this line of um, friending someone um, versus you know, because obviously you get more information, particularly on Facebook and, and LinkedIn, when you're you're a first connection or your friends. What what's your your advice on that? It's a great question. Um, yeah, we'll talk a little bit about this later on, whenever we address LinkedIn and the privacy settings in LinkedIn. If it feels weird to you, it is your personal account. You do what you're comfortable with. Um, I know that I don't get too many friend requests from donors um, myself on my Facebook, but I know development officers do receive those. Some development officers, development officers are totally fine accepting the friend request. Others have basically their own Facebook page that's kind of their their professional front, as it were, where they, they make those connections and then maybe they share a Facebook account with their spouse and partner where they have this kind of stuff for friends and family, like close friends, non-donor or work friends, you know, um, and so on and so forth. So I'd say what feels best for you. Um, I would also recommend talking to or reviewing your organization's guidelines, um, you know, maybe uh, talking to your leaders at your organization, say, hey, is this kosher for this organization to do this? They, they likely will have some thoughts and guidance too. So, um, but yeah, that's, I tell you that creepy feeling, it's like a spider sense, you know, and uh, if it feels weird, I, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> good, good advice, good advice. Okay, well, thank you for those questions and we'll pause again um, as more come in. Thank you. Fantastic, yeah, so the social media toolkit, Kind of the way that we work here at OSU in our prospect development shop, every resource we, we kind of view as a tool and we have our toolkit. And so for you know some 
some questions, some things you need the hammer, others you need a saw, others you need a drill. Um, you know, and where you think about social media, where we zoom in a little bit here on the, I think it's like over 20 social media platforms. There are three that we go to the most in, in our toolkit here at OSU Foundation. We go to Facebook generally, we go to Instagram, and we go to LinkedIn. So yeah, I have 16 on here. I, I think there's a few more. I was just looking at the slide again. I think there's a few more than, than 16 now. But um, yeah, Facebook. And like I said, we'll, we'll zoom in a bit more on Facebook a bit later, but we'll, we'll touch on it right now. Um, so as we talked about, 3 billion users, it is very helpful, and Catherine just mentioned this, for identifying family information, life events, and so on and so forth. Catherine also noted that if you are friends with somebody on Facebook, you can see more um, than if you're not friends. But it's the case with Facebook, it's the case with every social media platform. By creating a social media uh, account, you're agreeing to share some information about yourself. Um, you know, there's just some information that's going to be visible at all times. Facebook has, out of the social media platforms we'll be talking about, the most things that are always visible. So name is always visible, gender, username and user ID, which I think is you know, pretty self-explanatory, but I'm going to note it anyway. Also, if the following information is shared during account creation, it's going to be visible. So age range, language, and country. The profile picture in the cover photo, posts on Facebook pages and public groups, and then content shared by other users that you are tagged in. It's interesting because that content shared by other users that you are tagged in, that, that has definitely helped us out in a pinch a few times. Um, you know, and it, whenever, like I said, it's been, it's been 15 years since I created my Facebook account, and I really don't remember. <laughs> well, you know, I was like, oh no, I just created it. I, I don't know if I even really expected to use it that much. I had a MySpace account too, which is probably still out there, which is terrifying. Um, but I, I, frankly, if you're friends with me on my Facebook page, it's generally my wife tagging me on things. I'm not super active on it. Um, and then I was like, okay, what could, if somebody got help them were researching me, what, what would they be able to tell about me? So I logged out of my Facebook account and this is what I could see. So we'll look at the about section. We'll see where I work. We'll also, we'll also see if the previous place I worked at that. Um, so that's information you can get off of LinkedIn. You can see the college I studied at. So you can get that again from LinkedIn and then high school. I don't know if anybody, I, actually some people do care about where you went to high school. It's actually a really good prospecting uh, especially in a place like Oklahoma, uh, we're very location-based. Um, high school could be pretty helpful. So I was going to say people don't care about that, but people do care about it. Um, so those are, but that's that's information that generally can get somewhere else. You can get that on LinkedIn, you know, uh, if somebody of course has a LinkedIn account. And I do. The profile photos, though, it, it, the profile photo and the cover photo. That that's that's where you can start getting some of that information you can't get elsewhere. You can see my profile photo. I'm, I'm with a Beautiful woman uh, they could assume is probably my wife or at least life partner maybe. And you know, she is my wife, so you can, you, can, you can extrapolate. So, okay, he's probably married. And then you look at my cover photo, you can see there's three young people. And, you know, hey, yeah, that, that maybe, maybe those are young people that I'm just close to, nieces, nephews, so on and so forth. But you could also think, well, maybe those are children. You would be correct, those are children. Um, you know, one of the key things about being a researcher is that you have to be comfortable with extrapolating. You never get the full picture. You can get some pieces of the, you know, I always like to think of it as a donor puzzle. You know, when I'm conducting research, I'm trying to put together some puzzle pieces to get a picture of the donor. You can get some things from publicly available information, but, you know, you can't see in the bank accounts. You can't, you know, there's, there's some things that ethically, even if we could, we, we're not allowed to do because it violates our ethical standards. And then you kind of gather some you know, puzzle pieces from what a development officer is able to gather if, you know, when they, I almost said if they enter the contact reports, but when they enter the contact reports. And you put that together and you, you get a usually a pretty solid picture, but you always know that there are some things that you're missing. It's, it's like a glacier. You can, you can see what's above the ocean surface, 
you can't see everything below where the bulk of the bulk of the the really detailed information is, but you can extrapolate some things by what's above the ocean surface. And so, all that to say, even with you know not being friends with this with somebody on Facebook, generally speaking, you can tell some really useful things, and you may have to extrapolate some, but it is helpful and beneficial, generally speaking. Catherine mentioned in my intro, I have numerous dogs and cats. This is one of my dogs. This is not the actual dog in question. Uh, another one of my dogs makes an appearance in, in just a moment. But um, though anonymized, this is an actual situation. Each of these examples are actual situations that were encountered. Um, and this first one is the prospect has a dog. Uh, so one of our development officers was uh, planning a visit. It's, it's a discovery visit, an initial visit with a with a donor. So she hadn't met, met this donor before, and she was doing what she what she refers to as some light googling about the donor. And she stumbled across the donor's Facebook page and saw that she had a dog. Um, and we have a really awesome veterinary college here at OSU, and um, the development officer in question, she went and spoke with the development officer for our, veter our veterinary college because that development officer had like a box of these bandanas for what OSU vet med is what we call it. And that is the actual bandana in the picture my dog does have. One. So he's really bright orange because orange is the best color. Um, bandanas. Um, and she, the development officer was like, hey, can I have one of those to take on this visit? And the vet med development officer was like, sure, and gave her one. And I don't know exactly how the conversation took place. I do not, from what I understand, the, the, do not believe that the development officer said, hey, I happened to, I was looking at you, looking you up on Google, happened to come across your Facebook page. She's a very good development officer. I think she is, she was much savvier than that. But she gave the, the donor the bandana on the visit. The donor loved it. She was just really excited about it really helped break the ice on the visit. And when the development officer was um, kind of doing a little bit, again, light Googling a bit later, she saw that the donor had changed her, at least her cover photo or, or her profile picture to one of her dog wearing the bandana. So um, information you wouldn't have found anywhere else. You know, uh, it just happened to come across this and it really helped break the ice with this donor. We already touched on this and, and we touched on it because it's a fact that Facebook is fantastic for um, kind of filling in the gaps in family relationships and servicing relationships we are not aware of. And that was certainly the case here where one of my researchers was conducting prospect, some research on a prospect and found the donor's Facebook page and saw that the donor had two college age children, which we did not have noted in our database. And so there were also pictures, um, which the researcher was able to see, of the donor's grandchildren standing next to one of the entrances to campus. Um, and with a, along with the picture was a comment about how they're so excited that their grandchildren were going to be continuing the cowboy tradition in the family and attending OSU. So um, information we didn't have noted in our CRM, we were able to share it with our records department, get that updated on their record. Also, this really, of course, helped inform the relationship with the prospect because I guess it did not come up, come up in conversation with the prospect that they're having grandchildren coming to OSU. So really helped the development officer adjust their approach uh, with how they're working with the prospect. So Instagram. Instagram is next. Instagram, 2 billion users, really helpful for identifying hobbies interests and assets that can influence gift capacity calculation. Also, again, a shout out to Pinterest. Uh, Pinterest is very helpful for this as well, even though it has a fraction of the user base that Instagram does. Because both Instagram and Pinterest are more of a visual medium in terms of a social media platform, there is some overlap in users. Instagram, because it is serving a bit of a different audience and a different purpose, has less information that's always available on it than Facebook. So it's just a profile image in a bio. Most of the bios I've come across have been fairly sparse, but occasionally you will come across a bio that does have, you know, 
proud parent of three children, you know, love racing cars, you know, that, that sort of thing. Occasionally you will come up across a decent bio. Um, that's the second dog picture, by the way. This is taken from, um, actually, for the purposes of this presentation, um, the person that painted the picture of their dog, <laughs> and this is very generally, you know, uh, you know, we'll, we'll need to go ahead and read it. Today's Bride Spa is brought to you by a surprise painting of one of her pets, which we are not aware of. She maintains a fantastic Instagram page and a Pinterest page. She, is a, she loves painting. She's very visual. She's also one of our top donors. <laughs> so um, I think we knew that she had some pets, didn't know she had this dog. Um, really, not only helped with kind of some of the initial research we conducted on this prospect, but also just over time, you know, kind of seeing, okay, where are some recent paintings, where are some really some things that she seems to be interested in, really helps inform that relationship with her. Um, and it is really kind of something that you, you, you I take a, maybe a quick glance at both the Pinterest and the Instagram page um, before kind of the next visit and so on and so forth. She has a lovely place out in Colorado, out in the mountains. Um, and it's just really in a fascinating way has helped inform the relationship, the philanthropic relationship with this prospect. This is one that the uh, researcher I was talking about earlier, he came across this example too, where um, located a prospect's Instagram page and found that they had a massive car collection. It's a very, this is not one of the cars in question, it was a very specific kind of vehicle, is an Italian model, I believe, and he's probably one of, if not the uh, largest collectors of this very specific type of automobile in the entire world. So certainly had an influence on capacity, also, again, just something that this donor is passionate about, you know, and they do travel and show off vehicles in this collection around the world. And so that's something else to be mindful of, too, is that because he is such a well-known collector in this space, okay, there's, you know, the Pebble, Pebble Beach car show. There are other car shows around the world. It's likely going to be in attendance. So, again, informing that relationship in terms of the timing and approach with a prospect. Speaking of timing and approach with the prospect, <laughs> this was an interesting one. It was a little bit out of the norm, um, but basically Development Monster had re a really hard time connecting with this prospect. And so we did some searching and found that the prospects, we got the prospect's Instagram page and found that they were on a, a very elaborate, one would say, uh, vacation, multi-month vacation. They are definitely one of those folks that use the summer as a verb. Um, and so we were, you know, we just kind of reached out to the development officer. It's like, look, at least for the summer, they're probably going to be a bit out of pocket, going to be hard to connect with. You know, maybe in the fall, you could try circling back around again. Um, so, yeah, you just never know. Again, the full range of the human experience is what you find on social media. Um, you know, exactly what you'll discover when you're conducting this research. Now, LinkedIn, like I said at the start of this, my favorite social media platform because it does alleviate the creepy factor. <laughs> you know, when you look at what is always visible on LinkedIn, nine times out of 10, it's everything. Um, because it's made for people that you don't really know. It is made for being discovered uh, for somebody that you're not familiar with, that you don't know generally. I mean, of course, you're connected to people you don't know, but you're also like, hey, I want to put myself out here as an expert in my field, or I'm on the hunt for a new position or job. So therefore, everything's pretty visible. And, and again, that helps with the creepy factor. Um, so LinkedIn, I would imagine maybe in a couple of years, you know, if not a little bit longer or maybe sooner, I don't know. It's hard. It's really hard to, to predict this stuff. We'll probably be crossing the 1 billion user uh, threshold. Also, when I was putting this presentation together, I asked development officers for any feedback about how they've leveraged social media. And this was one that came back from a couple of people that they're actually having better luck with in-mail in LinkedIn than traditional email with, in terms of connecting with prospects. So wanted to be sure to note that. I also want to touch on, in terms of what is always visible on LinkedIn, the default privacy settings of LinkedIn. The default privacy settings are so that if you go to somebody's page, LinkedIn page, 
and you found them in LinkedIn, <laughs> they will be able to see your name and your employer. So, for example, I, I come across Catherine's LinkedIn page on LinkedIn. Catherine would be able to see with the default privacy settings, Jacob Astley, that Oklahoma State University Foundation be your profile. You can adjust your privacy settings so that it will just say someone at Oklahoma State University Foundation viewed your profile. If you were to do that, that will not violate APRA's ethical guidelines because you're not creating a false account or anything like that. It is your personal LinkedIn account. So the privacy settings can be adjusted to your preferences. So I wanted to be sure to touch on that because I know that it has been a question that's come up before as well. If I said it that way, am I, am I not being transparent about my job? Am I not, you know, by being deceptive? And so APRA has addressed that. Um, if you, I believe I believe a copy of this presentation will be sent out afterward. Um, I'm happy to share it with you as well. I have all my sources hyperlinked in the slide deck. So um, there's a hyperlink on this slide that goes directly to those guidelines. So I want to be sure to touch on that. I think generally speaking, I never like to assume anything, but I'll, I'll go ahead and assume that everybody on this call is familiar with LinkedIn, at least what its purpose it is. So it is a great resource for getting somebody's career, education, you know, history, and so on and so forth. But there is that activity feed, which is easy to miss. Maybe it's just easy for me to miss. Uh, but I feel, I feel like the, the way it's kind of nestled in there is easy to miss. It is super, super insightful. At least it can be, depending on how active somebody is on social on LinkedIn. But that's true of any social media platform. If they're not active, it's not going to do you much good. But I have found it to be a very helpful tab to click over to in terms of identifying interest to identifying if somebody is engaging on your institutional on your institution's social media presence or on posts if you work at a cause based or you know institution on posts that relate to your cause um, it's it's actually it seems like in, in, in the past few years it's become more and more helpful um, and I, that may be because of that growth that LinkedIn saw during the pandemic. So these are actual posts that um, a prospect I was researching um, was interacting on in, in OSU social media space. This is somebody that kind of given to us in probably 30 years. Um, she had been a donor at one time, but deeply lapsed donor. And whenever that's the case, you're like, okay, are, are they still following us? Do they still think about OSU as a group? <laughs> and so I found her LinkedIn account and clicked on the activity tab and heck yeah, she's following us. <laughs> so there was, you know, these, these, this is from a little bit, a couple of years ago, these screenshots, but um, pictures of campus that had been shared on, OS, on Oklahoma State University's LinkedIn account. Our long-term president, long-serving president, Burns Hargis was retiring around this time, and she was interacting on quite a few posts about Mr. Hargis. So she was actively following us. And whenever I referred her out to a process to a development officer, I said, "Look, yeah, it's been a little bit since she's given, but she's engaging on OSU's LinkedIn space. She hasn't forgotten about us because sometimes you do you come across somebody that graduated decades ago, and it's just like we're just a, a blip in their memory of that." That was certainly not the case here. This other one with the uh, Philadelphia Eagles uh, logo uh, in the picture. This is somebody that was it's very much a mover and shaker in the environmental uh, industry space. Um, she works at, for, she's actually president at a company that's very involved in things like turf grass. <laughs> and with the Super Bowl back in February, there was turf grass used um that was developed at oklahoma state university and I'll, i really appreciate this post she said i love it when my two worlds collide hashtag turf grass grass and hashtag go pokes of course that's a kind of a osu's thing go pokes uh pistols firing so on and so forth so um really love seeing that i'm also super curious how many things are tagged with hashtag turf grass but that's beside the point um again somebody that don't believe she's a donor yet. Um, I know she will be, I'm sure of it. 
that this is another way to kind of indicate that affinity. So yeah, there's not really giving to indicate affinity, but we do have these social media interactions to indicate affinity. Um, and that's a great starting point. So before we dive in on who's engaging on your Facebook posts, I want to pause to see if there are any questions. Uh, there, there have been a few questions, but I, I feel that like they've been um, addressed in terms of the, the privacy settings and um, it, exactly what, what you mentioned about um, should you, what, what, what are the rules around privacy settings? So I believe we've answered that question, but keep them coming awesome. in. Thank Great. you. Yeah, all right, so like I mentioned earlier, Facebook is so massive <laughs> that uh, we're going we're gonna to spend a little bit of extra time on it. If you go to my LinkedIn page, you will see that uh, prior to OSU, I worked at University of Central Oklahoma, which is a great institution. It, it started me in this field. I'll be eternally grateful for UCO. It is a much smaller shop than OSU. And so I'm sure there are people on this call that are like, you know, as, as I talk about this, they're like, well, look, this is all great, but I don't have the bandwidth, you know, to track who's engaging on our Facebook pages. You know, I mean, that, that's all well and good, but prospect research is one of five jobs that I do. I was in that boat <laughs> and I totally respect that, 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 you know, that approach in terms of, you know, look, I'm doing good, just keep my head above water. But I do want to touch on some things here and say, you know, even if you are at a shop like that, you can do something with it. You can do something with social media. Um, you don't have to do everything. <laughs> but you, as we go through this, uh, please, please um, try to think of some opportunities here, I would say, um, to leverage social media, even if it's just a fraction of it. Starting off, in general, the same people interact on your institution's content. And I would argue that that's true across social media in general. If you think about who interacts on your posts on social media, it's usually the same people. It's very rare that that person you went to high school with 30 years ago just out of the blue comments on your post. And whenever that happens to me, <laughs> it always catches me off guard. I'm like, I completely forgot I was friends with that person. So, it gets, again, that volume of social media data can seem overwhelming at first, but start looking at who's doing the posting and the liking and the, and the commenting. It's probably going to be, generally speaking, the same people. And speaking of comments, comments are gold. It takes half a second to like something, but if somebody takes the time to leave a thoughtful comment on your post, it is worth taking a closer look. Even if you're at one of those shops where prospect research is one of the five things that you do, please pay attention to who's commenting. Brent Grinna, who's CEO of Evertree, which is, you know, does a lot of great stuff in this space, he, I can't remember exactly how he puts it, but he says, if somebody mailed a letter to your, uh, your institution, you wouldn't just toss it in the trash or ignore it, you'd read it. Pretend that comments are letters, treat them that way. And I think it's a great approach to take. Even if someone does not have major capacity, but they are active on your social media, in your social media presence, in a positive fashion, have to put that, that caveat in there. They may be able to give back to your institution by boosting your content on giving days and things of that nature. So I would also keep track of those folks, even if they can't, you know, endow a scholarship, they love your institution or your cause. There's other ways they can give back. I, I keep track of them. And partner, if you have a marketing communications team, and that's not one of the five jobs that you're doing, uh, try to partner up with those folks. You know, if they're going to be, we're doing a, a fundraising campaign around a human performance institute here at OSU. And that's kind of been one of the things I've asked of our marketing communications department is, hey, if y'all could be posting about the human performance institute, you know, in the coming weeks, let us know and we'll put that on our calendar so we can keep a close eye on that post. Uh, because again, there is a lot of there is a lot of data, a lot of volume with this space. It'd be hard to keep track of. And so if you put some on, something on the calendar, <laughs> that that'll be very helpful. So, yeah, there are a lot of posts, but there are certain posts that seem to draw out the best prospects. The ones that do so are the posts that pose a question or ask readers to share a memory. So you're prompting the, the people reading the post to somehow interact with it. Those are great ones for prospecting. Posts that have an image from a long time ago, because 
it can feel a little cheap to draw on nostalgia, but it works. If you if you if, if you're at a higher ed institution, there's a picture of campus from 1984. You'll get people that were students here in 1984 sharing very thoughtful memories about their time as a student and likely sharing insights that you're not aware of. Posts that highlight something cool or innovative that your institution is doing. And so that's not drawn on the past. It's not drawn on nostalgia. This is cool stuff we're doing now. Um, people love to see innovation and creativity um, in your institution. I want to note that engagement does not necessarily equate to a post that is really valuable for prospecting. I'm especially thinking about athletics related posts. <laughs> If your team wins, your team loses, there's going to be a lot of reactions and comments on it. Now, if you're managing somebody, yeah, it's good to know that, okay, they're pretty angry about the outcome of the football game last weekend. But if you're proactively like digging through posts for really good prospects, I just have not had a ton of luck with those kinds of posts. For ourselves, the top Facebook pages that we use for prospecting are the OSU Alumni Association, because I talk about cool things that are happening now and cool things that happened in the past. Oklahoma State University Archives, and that's actually the picture in the slide is from the o OSU Archives page that's run by our library, and it's just fantastic. Again, thinking about that demographic of people that are the best prospects, generally 55 and older, um, they love that page. Um, College specific pages, and then main university um, pages as well are our top ones for prospecting. This is a post from our alumni association. Every summer they have what's called Grandparents University, where grandparents can basically pretend to be students again with their grandchildren at OSU. It's a week-long program. So the, the grandparent and the grandchildren live on, in dorms on campus. They attend class. And then there's a graduation ceremony at the end. So it's a really good way to kind of, and you know, we talked about grandparents earlier in the presentation, but really a great way to bring generations together and always to post around it, have fantastic comments. And sometimes comments from people that we didn't know were participating in Grandparent University that were like, oh, that's good to know. <laughs> Let's let the development officer, let their manager, you know, give them a heads up. So um, I love this one because it's an example of both the past and the future in the present, you know, all coming together. The OSU archives, again, just fantastic. You know, this is a post about uh, basically 1979, OSU's residence halls were honored and people shared memories about not just living in the residence halls on campus back then, but also just student life in general. We were able to get some insights and some established prospects this way and also find some new potential prospects with this post. So it, was, it was incredible. This is a post from our College of Education and Human Sciences, which is where our aviation program lives. There is a, um, our student pilots are called the Flying Aggies uh, in honor of OSU's previous incarnation as Oklahoma A&M. And uh, recently we dedicated a flight center on campus thanks to a generous donation. And I have to say, <laughs> I think this is true of any hobby, if somebody has aviation as a hobby, they love aviation with a capital L, <laughs> and they they comment a lot. And so we've got some really great content around this flight center dedication, um, some really good insights into current prospects, and also a great way to identify new prospects as well. Kind of zooming in a bit into our prospect development teams, the prospect engagement team specifically in our department, we, we are really trying to leverage um, social media more and more in terms of how we build prospect lists. And so Becky Brown, who uh, she's just a rock star, she's our prospect engagement analyst. Um, she's in charge of building targeted prospect lists for development officers based on you know, based whatever the, the development officer has, happens to be fundraising for at the time, where they're traveling, different initiatives, so on and so forth. And we do use Evertrue to help kind of, you know, filter the tide, or I should say filter the ocean <laughs> of social media data um, and, and sift through it. But you don't have to have a tool like Evertrue. Like I said at the start of this, you can still track some things off, off to the side that can really benefit you. And if you especially put those into your CRM, 
um, with seeing, you know, who is engaging with you, who has affinity for you. It's another dimension of affinity, basically. That's what social media is. You know, if you think of giving as one dimension of affinity, event participation is another dimension of affinity, and then there's social media as the dimension of affinity. That's what we've really been trying to incorporate um, into our list building. We've been having really, really great results. If, um, you know, certainly I would argue when you send a prospect list, this is better than average statistics for prospects that responded to the outreach. Um, and this has just grown. This, these numbers are pulled back in May. And I know that in that time, um, Becky's got even more numbers to draw and gotten more sophisticated. We're also putting together Facebook engagement reports um, with this data to share, okay, these are the posts that got the most interactions, the most comments, so on and so forth that we're sharing with foundation leadership and also with campus partners as well. Um, and if anybody has any questions about what those look like or would like to set up a call, please feel free to reach out. We're, we're always more, more than happy to chat. If you have ideas to share, <laughs> we love those ideas as well. Cause like I said, we're still kind of building this out. So scenarios, as we kind of get close to wrapping up here, um, these are various scenarios that I've encountered over the years. Um, these are how I approach them. I did run this by our legal counsel's office as well. Um, and then they, they gave me the blessing on it too. So um, this, this was vetted by lawyers. Um, this first scenario is actually one of the very first I encountered as a research researcher. This is back in 2008. and I was researching someone, this is probably like the third person I ever researched in my life. <laughs> um, I came across a re his, uh, this prospect's very close relative's Facebook page, I mean, I'm sorry, MySpace page, it was 2008, MySpace page, where they're basically blogging about a very serious illness they were dealing with. And so, again, given the nature of this person's relation, relationship to the prospect I was researching. I knew this was going to have a really deep impact on the prospect. So I paused the research, found the development officer that requested the research and, and verbally communicated to her the situation. She's like, yeah, that's this isn't a good time to reach, reach out. Um, I did note what I had found in our CRM, but I didn't go into any detail. I just said, this is a very serious health challenge and uh, to direct, you know, please see prospect development for additional details if needed. So, again, using discretion, treating what you find with respect, and being professional. That's what you do when you come across something that, um, you know, is, is basically a life altering situation that you're seeing. Because, again, it's not just happy stuff that's shared um, on social media. It's the full spectrum of the human experience. And I want to be respectful of that. And put yourself in that person's shoes. How would I want to be treated if I were the prospect? So the second one, um, God help us, we're entering an election year next year. So this is probably going to be coming up. Prospect social media shows very strongly held political beliefs. I, I do not go into detail. <laughs> I just say which direction they lean in and that they are strongly held, and I'll leave it at that. Third one, social media indicates that the prospect is going through a divorce. Kind of, you know, this ties a bit into the first one we talked about. So this is a case, you know, it's not necessarily the case, of course, with, with health, because that's, you know, you got HIPAA there, you got some other things there. You can work on confirming um, a divorce through primary source information. I always want to treat, even, Yes, social media is a primary source, but I'll touch on this in a second. You still want to confirm something like a relationship change, a marriage or divorce in social media through court records. And I say that because we actually had a pretty recent situation where uh, somebody we were researching said they were divorced on social media. And this was a very significant donor to us. We were not able to confirm it in social media and about a, I mean, I'm sorry, in court records. It's still there in social media. <laughs> so a few months later, you know, I was talking to the development officer that works with this prospect. And I was like, so I was like, look, I still haven't, my team hasn't been able to confirm this. And she's like, oh yeah, they got back together. 
<laughs> you know, so human relationships are complicated. And sometimes social media is used as a platform to communicate certain things to other partners in a relationship. You know, it's and you, again, is this informing a fundraising decision? Well, you could say it's informing it to the extent that this may not be a great time to ask them for to commit to a five year you know pledge <laughs> because they're going through some things in their personal life. But sometimes social media, because it comes directly from that person, they're able to just with a click of a button change your relationship status. That that can be done much more quickly than say actually going through the process of getting a divorce or getting married. Um, so all that to say, if you can confirm it through court records. If you can't do so, indicate that they appear to be in the process of going through a divorce per social media. And you know, put it put it again, put a note on your calendar, to try to confirm this um, at some later date. So the final scenario, prospect graduated from your institution, but does not note your institution in their education. Um, we do come across this from time to time, especially we we have a class of prospects here at OSU called unicorns. These are people with a ton of capacity, but they've gone very cold. Um, it doesn't hurt to double check with your registrar if they actually graduated from your institution. It also doesn't hurt to double check that you're researching the correct person. <laughs> that sounds very obvious, but sometimes the most obvious things and the simplest things are, are the easiest ones to miss. So I wanted to make sure to note that. Um, but say you confirm all those, yeah, they, they graduated from here back in you know, 1974. Um, you are researching the right person. If that's their correct you know, LinkedIn page, they're extremely cold then. It's good to know that they indicated you on their LinkedIn. That's a star because I've come across people where they didn't even have a snow on their LinkedIn. That's especially true. It seems to be with um, international students that went on to get an advanced degree from another institution. Um, but it's just a good thing to note to your you know, development officers that this is going to be a bit of a lift in terms of you know, reestablishing that connection. Um, it's kind of the opposite of the LinkedIn example I shared earlier, where they hadn't given in a long time, but they're still actively, you know, following us on LinkedIn. This is the case where these are cases where, yeah, they're just completely cold. So just something to be aware of. So tips and trips in wrapping up. If a prospect does not have a social media presence, their spouse or partner or other family members may. I you know mentioned at the start of the presentation that. I'm not super active on my Facebook page, but my wife is. <laughs> so all the uh, family happenings with the Astley family, you, you can pretty much see because uh, my wife, love her to death, you know, tags me in a lot of things. So um, that's actually come through in a pinch for us with people we've researched where it's like, okay, I haven't found this person, but I did find um, you know, their spouse or partner's page, or even sometimes their children's page their adult children, maybe tag them in a family reunion or something like that, or on a family trip, uh, that's been helpful. We didn't talk a ton about YouTube, but YouTube is incredibly helpful for filling in gaps in information about somebody, especially, especially if you can find an interview or a fireside chat with somebody. Um, there's actually a fireside chat I found with one of my unicorns, somebody that I found has a ton of capacity that we're trying to get in the door with. And it was 40 minutes, and he's actually, he came here as an international student, and I was always curious about what brought him to Oklahoma. Then got an advanced degree at a university in Kansas, and I'm like, okay, so he didn't immediately go back home. He went to Kansas, which he would have stayed here, but whatever. <laughs> but he still kind of stayed in the area. And then he went to California, had a great success out there, and then he went back home. To his home country and i found a fireside chat with him and i just kind of played it while i was eating lunch and you know i didn't listen intently to the whole thing he's a, he's an expert in his industry so there was a lot of kind of shop talk that he talked about what brought him to oklahoma he talked about what kept him in the united states after he graduated and then he talked about how there was a family illness and he went back home so he went back home to be with that family member that was ill and then kind of start a new company in his home country. 
So that was incredibly helpful for filling in the gaps in our knowledge about him and also very helpful in assessing his mannerisms, speaking style, demeanor, especially if somebody's really cold, you know, in terms of our knowledge of them and we haven't interacted with them. And we're like, okay, you know, what can we expect <laughs> as it were? Say we say we do get in the door with them. YouTube is a great resource for that. I talked about this earlier. There, there are services that purport to search for prospects profiles across various social media platforms. I tried out the free version of those and maybe it's because I was trying the free version. I didn't have a ton of luck. When I was presenting this at APRA, some people kind of gave some, suggest, some suggestions about other platforms that may be helpful for that. Unfortunately, I did not write those down. There was a lot going on. But you know, there may be some ones that it's worth a try. I still would recommend being thorough and just searching for that person directly on the social media platform. And then my researcher, Blake, he's actually the gentleman that was, uh, I used him as an example earlier on, but he was like, hey, Jacob, I know you're giving this presentation. Don't forget to mention, look at who's tagging your institution in their social media posts. So that's a great example. All right, I mean, a great suggestion. Um, Blake, he found a really good parent prospect this way. Uh, somebody was really excited about joining the Cowboy family. So I spoke at the start of this about TikTok. <laughs> I don't, I rarely use TikTok. Usually I only looked at TikTok because I was on Instagram or, or Facebook and somebody linked a, a TikTok video. But my kiddos have two uh, late teen boys, uh, so they're late teens, and then I have a daughter that's very much preteen. <laughs> they love TikTok. I, uh, I'll say I've never used, I mean, I rarely use TikTok, never use Snapchat. They love Snapchat. There's, there are certainly some up and coming uh, social media platforms. I mentioned at the start of this, I had 16 noted. The number's probably closer to 20 now. Um, if you have any young people in your orbit, it never hurts to keep your ear to the ground about what they're using. Because I tell you what, there was a time, and of course I was younger myself, but hey, what's this Facebook thing everybody's talking about, right? <laughs> you know, what's this MySpace thing everybody's talking about? I'm sure there was some soul in 1997 that was like, what is this six degrees thing somebody's talking about? So it doesn't hurt to keep your ear to the ground. Doesn't mean you necessarily need to really use it, you know, add it to your social media toolbox, as it were. But keep your ear to the ground. If you kind of reach critical mass on it, go ahead and check it out. But at the same time, just because something is popular doesn't mean it's necessarily super helpful from a process prospecting standpoint and I you know I think TikTok at least for me falls in that category certainly let me know in the comments if you've and let others know if TikTok has ever been helpful from a prospecting standpoint but at the end of the day Facebook still has that largest user base by a significant amount and at least for the time being the age demographics of Facebook are the ones that most nicely line up with the most promising prospects and with those prospects that you know, you're know you gonna be researching. So yeah, even with all those caveats, I still think Facebook, you know, at least, at least in the year of our Lord 2023, is still the top one. So um, thank you. Thank you for staying a little bit over for this presentation. My apologies for going over, but hopefully this was helpful for you. Um, please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn, shoot me an email. Um, I'm always happy to hop on a call and talk about our methods, or if you have any ideas or thoughts or things I've missed and said, hey, Jacob, you all might want to try this out at OSU. I love hearing about how other people approach this, this area. It's, it's endlessly fascinating to me, and thank you to Insightful uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk about it. Oh, Jacob, thank you. Thank you so, so much. What amazing examples and the, the scenarios truly helpful insight. Um, I, I love that you brought up the nostalgia aspect. That's just, it's its so true. And the, the audience is agreeing. There's a lot of really nice comments. Thank you to those of you um, who are commenting and also agree that, that Facebook seems to be where it's at. Facebook, uh, Instagram is right now, especially with limited resources, that's that's the best place to respect. If you're at one of the small shops, if you can only look at, not to turn to a Facebook sales pitch, you know, but yeah, if you only had to focus on one, there's a clear, clear one to focus on. So, 
Oh, well, thank you so much again for your time. It was truly very valuable. And um, I just want to say, yes, in the interest of time, um, if there are any other questions, we will commit to following up with you after today's presentation. And so I do want to thank all of our attendees today. And Jacob, as you mentioned, thank you. The presentation was brought to you by Insightful. If you're interested in learning more about how Insightful delivers information that your organization can't afford to miss, we offer complimentary customized demonstrations. So gather your team or just yourself and we'll be happy to show you around. You can let us know in the survey following um, today's session if you're interested. Or if you download this PowerPoint, um, it's in the handout section. There's a link to the request form there. And we also encourage you to check out our podcast. It's called No More, Raise More. It's packed with conversations between fundraisers and donors, how they built relationships, how they rebuilt relationships over time. Um, and we think that you'll find it very valuable. Again, there's a direct link in this presentation, or you can search for No More, Raise More on the platform where you listen to your podcasts. So again, Thank you, Jacob. Thank you to our guests for the interaction and the great questions. We hope that you found this session valuable and that you have some really actionable ways to build out your prospect profiles through social media. Again, if you have a question or you think of something after the presentation, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Our information is on the screen. As you exit today, you'll see a brief three question survey Please take a moment to let us know what you thought about today's session and how we can improve in the future. So on behalf of the Insightful team and the OSU Foundation, thank you for spending part of your day with us. Goodbye. Thank you.